Welcome to this session. We're looking at the big picture of how we look beyond where we now are to look emerging transformation, practical strategies for systemic change, local, national, and global. How do we think about that in a practical way? The Democracy Collaborative, and particularly its next system project, folks here are all part of that, have been looking at this from step by step of what do you do in the local neighborhood? What do you do in the local firm? How do you build from the bottom up step by step to think about the big picture, what's producing the trends in ecology, income inequality, racial injustice, climate change, et cetera, et cetera, and indeed even the global war and war stance that many nations find themselves in. How do you look at what it would take to literally change the system step by step in a practical way? So lots of, lots of work being done today and the panel you have before you are specialists in different areas as well as generalists on the big picture and theoretical problems. Let me first introduce Thomas Hanna, who's the Director of Research at the Democracy Collaborative, to kick us off. Thomas? Thank you, Gar, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Gar mentioned, my name is Thomas Hanna. I'm the Research Director at the Democracy Collaborative, and I'm based in Washington, DC. I specialize in alternative models of ownership, and particularly public ownership, cooperative ownership, community ownership, and the like. In 2018, I published a book on the surprising prevalence of public ownership in the United States, and I've also authored numerous reports, papers, articles on various related subjects. I also serve on the advisory board of the Public Banking Institute and various other domestic and international projects and groups. So after the year that we've just had, I don't think it's too controversial to assert that our society and our world is in crisis. And while it's tempting to simply want to return to the status quo of a year ago or four years ago, I think that this is an adequate reading of our history and a dangerous one at that. What we're actually experiencing is a systemic crisis, a multitude of intersecting and escalating economic, social, and ecological challenges resulting from the inherent structural limitations of the political economic system we have developed over decades and generations. One of the signs that a crisis is systemic rather than purely political or economic is that key indicators decline or stay the same regardless of changes in political power or business cycles. Since 1970, the U.S. has experienced seven party changes in the White House, including the most recent one, assuming, of course, nothing crazy happens in the next couple of weeks, five party changes in control of the Senate, and four in the House of Representatives. We've also experienced eight recessions and seven recoveries. However, on many important indicators of economic, social, and democratic health, there has been little improvement and, in many cases, substantial deterioration over this period. This includes important indicators such as poverty, wealth inequality, racial wealth inequality, wage stagnation, the cost of higher education, student loan debt, income inequality, home ownership, racial disparities in home ownership, corporate taxation, taxation of the rich, union density, incarceration rates, labor force participation rates, healthcare costs, climate change, life expectancy, and on and on and on. To give just one example, trends around wealth inequality have been deteriorating steadily. Since 1970, the wealth share of the top 1% has substantially increased, while that of the middle 40% has fallen. The bottom 50% has seen virtually no improvement with any gains wiped out during the 2008 financial crisis. And this is even more pronounced when you consider race. In 1983, Black and Latinx households had just 7,000 and $4,100 respectively in median net worth. Comparatively, the median net worth of white households was around 1,500% higher, at 105,300. However, by 2016, the median net worth of black families had fallen to roughly half that of 1983 levels, and the median net worth of white families had increased to 4,000% higher. Even before the pandemic, it was estimated that if these trends continue, the median black household wealth was on a path to hit zero by 2053, followed by Latinx median household wealth 20 years later. And while we don't yet have the data, it seems almost inevitable that the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting economic crisis will exacerbate and accelerate these trends. Another way to evaluate whether or not a crisis is systemic is to compare our system's outcomes against similar systems in other parts of the world. And while our political economic system certainly works well for some people, across numerous important social, economic, and environmental indicators, we actually fare quite poorly when compared to other advanced systems. 
and often even when compared to systems with far lower low levels of economic development. Again, just to provide some quick examples, when you use a common international standard for poverty and adjust for taxes and transfers, the US poverty rate ranks dead last out of all 36 countries in the OECD. On inequality, we're third from last behind only Mexico and Chile. On infant mortality, we have a rate that's more than double most other advanced countries and significantly behind countries like Cuba, Bosnia, and Antigua. And the list goes on. Incarceration, maternal mortality, life expectancy, violence, violence against women, healthcare costs, greenhouse gas emissions, homicide rates, weapons exports, economic democracy. We are at the bottom or close to it in all of these areas and more. So on that less than cheery note, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. It is my belief that our current system of corporate capitalism is currently in the midst of a long period of crisis as the late Italian economist Giovanni Origi uh, used to put it. And I think it's possible that we may be reaching the end of that period. As such, it is critically important to begin to ask the question, what comes next? Now, Origi and others have pointed out that in the past, when such long periods of crisis came to an end, capitalism has been able to reconstitute itself on new and enlarged foundations. However, there are reasons to believe that this enlargement and expansion process may not be possible in this case. Capitalism now already reaches virtually every corner of the globe and is running into climate and resource barriers at an accelerated rate. One alternative and hopeful possibility is that over the coming period, the long crisis of corporate capitalism gives way through a great struggle and powerful movement for change to the creation of a more democratic, reparative, and ecologically sustainable economy and society. In embryo, this political economic system already exists. It goes by many names, such as the social economy, the solidarity economy, and the democratic economy. And its institutions, strategies, and approaches have been slowly developing for years in the interstices of global capitalism, to use Eric Olin Wright's terminology, or at the edges of US imperialism and hegemony, to paraphrase my friend and colleague, Gar Alpovitz. For years, we at the Democracy Collaborative have been documenting the rise of these institutions, strategies, and approaches, doing what we can to accelerate their development and proliferation, and suggesting new models, innovations, and ways to achieve scale and impact. One of the ways we do this is through our community wealth building framework, which is now proliferating in the US, the UK, and elsewhere around the world. Community wealth building works to produce broadly shared economic prosperity, racial equity, and ecological sustainability to the reconfiguration of local institutions and economic strategies on the basis of greater democratic ownership, participation, and control. Community wealth building includes institutions such as cooperatives, public enterprises and banks, community land trusts, social housing, community-based nonprofits, and so on, all of which have service to the public good at their core rather than profit maximization. It also includes supportive strategies, such as linking these new institutions to the procurement investment power of large public and nonprofit profit anchor institutions, such as hospitals, universities, governments, and public pension funds. It includes redirecting public subsidies, incentives, and tax breaks away from large capitalist corporations that can block and hinder the proliferation of community-based alternatives. And it also includes experimenting with hybrid forms and approaches. While many of these institutions and approaches are commonplace in communities around the world and throughout history, they have thus far, with a few exceptions, not reached the scale and level of coordination necessary to represent a viable systemic alternative to corporate capitalism. What makes community wealth building relatively unique is that it recognizes the need to go beyond isolated projects, institutions, and communities, and move towards work that integrates multiple models and approaches into interlinked systemic designs. Community wealth building aims to model and advance deep systemic change, not simply improve the lives and livelihoods of a small number of people at the margins of the system as it is. It is a first order attempt at advancing change that when the opportunity arises, we hope will lead towards larger scale transformation. In other words, it is a full system approach that links community development with economic, social, and political interventions at a variety of scales to move towards a political economic system beyond corporate capitalism. Before I turn things over to my colleagues to talk a bit more about some of the additional vectors of our work, I do wanna end with a note of caution. A more democratic, equitable, and sustainable economy is not the only option ahead of us and probably it's not the most likely option. 
As the long crisis continues and our intersecting challenges continue to intensify, multiple paths are opening up, many of them fraught with danger. While corporate capitalism is unlikely to be the last political economic system in human history, that does not guarantee that what comes next will be any better. In order to avoid a dark future marked by authoritarianism, racism, xenophobia, social strife, and ecological decay, we must reject the urge to return to the status quo and instead act decisively now to create and scale the institutions and approaches that can lead us down the road to a better future. Thank you all so much for being here, and I'm really looking forward to answering whatever questions I can during the Q&A session. And Gar, back over to you. Thank you, Thomas. I think in the question period, we'll be able to get into details on the many, many, many practical examples of community cooperatives, municipal land trusts, public ownership at the local level, regional level, Tennessee Valley, lots of things going on around the country that don't get much press, but the direction is building towards something that looks like a different system, not American capitalism, not state socialism, something very democratic and beyond. So let me let me now toss it over to Isaiah Poole, who are our communications, uh, vice president of communications, to take it from there. And, and Isaiah, you're on. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, jumping off from where Thomas left us, in thinking about the 2020 election, uh, I'm reminded of what our colleague Joe Guinan uh, said in an interview uh, he just did with uh, Renewal Magazine uh, a few weeks ago. And there he pointed out that if you look at the election results, it is true. It's not great news for those of us on the left end of the political spectrum. We did not walk out of the United States election with what looks like a sweeping mandate. I have a theory though about what we did see in the election that does give me some cautious optimism. There is in fact a broad rejection of the status quo on both sides. Now there is plenty of scorn to go around for uh, big government, for big business, big pharma, big tech, big finance, big fill in the blank. What's common is that people see both wealth and power leaving their hands and landing on the laps of people who they have no connection with, and as far as they can tell, care nothing about them. There is an opportunity, therefore, to present a different option in which people can see themselves as the one, ones who are shaping the economy and our political institutions and the ones benefiting from those decisions where the political and economic systems work for us and not the other way around. Now, in October, we tested, the Democracy Collaborative tested that thesis in a poll we did with the polling organization YouGov. In that poll, we asked about a thousand voters across the political spectrum about their support for a set of policies that reflect our vision of a democratic economy one in which wealth and power is decentralized to provision of essential products and services is in public rather than private hands. And the priorities are racial equity and reparative justice and protection of the planet. Uh, one of the questions we asked is looking at where we are today, given COVID-19 and all of the uh, devastation that in the economy that has been wreaked by COVID-19, one of the legitimate fears is that that really cute animal that we allowed into our house a few years ago, the one that was so cute that it allowed us to like click and buy something and it arrived on our door within a day or two. Well, that monster is now, that, that cute animal has now become a big monster that has wrecked everything in the house, is eating everything, and is really making it impossible for anything else to grow and thrive. And so the question is, what do we do about that? And when we ask the question about what we see as the threat of an Amazon economy in which 
you know, we have one company uh, at the end of October got $96 billion in one quarter in revenue and $6.3 billion in profits. You see in the, in the poll in front of you that yes, people do want government to do something to make sure that Amazon and the businesses in that category don't swallow up our entire eco economic ecosystem. Um, but the uh, on top of that, there we go. But looking, spreading out a little bit bigger, we asked the question about support in general for more government intervention in the in the economy. And what we see is that six in 10 people find themselves more willing to entertain the government provision of services, essential services like housing, healthcare, utilities, internet. The things that for years conservative politicians have told us are best provided by the private sector. This reflects what Thomas talked about just a couple of moments ago, that people are recognizing that we are in a period of systemic breakdown. Now, it is true that the devil is in the details when we, when we ask questions like this, but since the devil is in the details, let's look at some details. We asked, for example, what people uh, uh, felt about uh, the provision of high-speed internet. There have been millions and, uh, upon millions of dollars have been spent on uh, preventing local municipalities from creating their own broadband services. And that policy has proven to be devastating in an age where we are now very dependent on the capacity to have broadband internet to uh, work from home, to do schooling from home. But 68% want the ability to do, have broadband that is run by a municipality and competes with um, the giants like Comcast and Cox and AT&T. And if uh, an elected official wanted to get on that platform, there would be public support for it. Likewise, given the news this weekend that there's a COVID-19 vaccine that is now being shipped around the country, uh, the question is, what would happen if we said that a government agency rather than a private big pharma company developed this vaccine? Actually, as you see in the poll, 64% uh, would support that. We have a problem with big pharma, which takes taxpayer dollars for research and feeds that into a Byzantine profit generator that makes these drugs then too expensive for the people who need them. And it turns out as research by Dana Brown in our Next System Project has shown that vaccines are an ideal place to start to build a new system in which pharmaceuticals are manufactured in the public domain, especially essential things like vaccines, um, uh, EpiPens for, for, um, uh, for uh, medical uh, crises that, um, that are made in the public domain not to feed shareholder profit. What about the, the question of how we rebuild our commercial corridors? If we don't want an Amazon economy, what would keep that from happening? One solution that we have been putting forward uh, is the creation of local economy preservation funds. These are funds that are ideally federally funded, but locally controlled with priorities for how the dollars are invested, driven by the priorities and economic vision of the communities 
the, themselves. If funds like this were already in place, communities could actually buy shares in businesses that are being forced to close due to COVID-19. They could keep then employees paid while they wait out this virus. And then when the businesses are reopened, uh, these uh, funds could then uh, pass on ownership to the workers themselves, could pass the uh, ownership to community institutions. They could take steps to make sure that these businesses remain locally rooted. Now, this is a new idea, but it does have majority support. And we are currently working uh, to get this idea in front of the Biden administration and in front of mayors around the country. There is even greater support for the idea that we use government to uh, government money to support the creation of locally based businesses that would provide such essential services as personal protective equipment for frontline essential workers. You know, one of the core elements in community wealth building is capturing the billions of dollars anchor institutions like hospitals spend each year and channel as many of those dollars as possible into the local business sector, into the pockets of local community workers. And we already have a nationwide network of hospitals that are invested in making that happen. And what we need is policy that aligns with that goal. And if elected leaders champion this, we can mobilize the public to get behind them. Finally, we are in another one of those moments where we say we are in the midst of a racial reckoning, but we have yet to fully commit ourselves to an agenda that actually works to repair the centuries of damage that white supremacy and systemic racism have, have done. We keep wanting to say that we have nothing to do with what happened in the past, but it's precisely our failure to address the wrongs of the past that is the knee on our necks that is choking us to death in the here and now. So the question is, what are we going to do about it? This poll does give us some insight into what is politically uh, viable in the current moment, such as calling on financial institutions that have been historically disinvested from black communities to reverse uh, that and invest more in black communities, to invest more in schools, black owned businesses, et cetera. All of the policies that I've outlined can be the start of a broader conversation that is not centered on how we build back what was there before, but build anew based on a different set of values about what it means to live in an inescapable network of mutuality, in which liberty is not solely about the mirage of individual choice that we have now, but is based on our collective caring, our collective honoring of each other's human dignity. It is absolutely true that this will be a difficult conversation in today's political and cultural environment, but we have to do it. And the hopeful news is that there are wedges in the body politic that if we widen them, will make it possible for us to succeed. Gar, back to you. Thank you, Isaiah. Uh, the, the, that he, Isaiah has only touched on the many, many, many examples of very practical things going on around the country at the local level, at the state level, and even proposals for major national change. If you go to the Next System Project or the Democracy Collaborative, lots of these examples, many, many more than we can possibly give you today, suggest the, the, what's happening just under the radar that's building up these kinds of examples for future possible exploitation and expansion as time goes on and as the economic and social and environmental crisis deepens. Let me turn now to Johanna, Johanna Bozoa. I'm pronouncing her name because she and I tease back and forth with our two long last names. And she's going to tell us a little bit more about environment and climate change where she's a specialist for many years now. Johanna. 
Hi, thank you so much, Gar, and thanks to everyone for having me today. Um, you know, I think uh, what has already been said um, really articulates, you know, the the fact that we are in this systemic crisis and um, that we have the opportunity now to build anew, as Isaiah said. And, um, you know, being at the Democracy Collaborative, I sometimes come at the issue of climate change from a little bit of a different framework than um, some of the, you know, um, more traditional greens, I'll say, because it's really rooted in concepts of economic justice, in in concepts of systemic crisis, um, moving past, you know, and, and I think that m much of the climate um, climate movement has pa uh, moved beyond the concept of like technological change as the the key driver, um, and is starting to adopt more of this systemic and um, political economy perspective that at the Democracy Collaborative um, on our climate team, we work really hard to, to advance. And, um, you know, just just to reify the point that's already been made, but um, the, the list that uh, Thomas put out there in terms of systemic trends, you know, really uh, around drivers of inequality, of racial injustice, of broken health care systems are the same ones that um, have driven us to the situation we have with the climate right now. And we've spent time uh, like talking a bit about um, how we build new systems. Uh, you know, Isaiah pointed to some of the very concrete actions. And, um, you know, I think there's often uh, attention in terms of those systemic proposals uh, of how long it will actually take, right? So, um, you know, it, th sometimes this stuff looks like generational change. It really takes time. But um, when you're working on issues of climate, um, as many at Bioneers, I'm sure are more uh, than aware, we really only have about 10 years to keep uh, our climate within 1.5 degrees, an equitable <laughs> amount of warming. And um, so that has real implications for how we go about doing that, um, doing that organizing and work. Um, because we both need to have the bottom up organizing. We need to see um, on the ground examples of these alternative um, economic and um, you know, energy systems that we will uh, have to implement across uh, across the United States and, and beyond. But we also at the same time have to be making kind of big, bold um, actions in the name of climate justice. We have to kind of throw down these major plays now so that we can actually have a livable climate. And uh, right now, in the ear of many, and I'm sure uh, during the Bioneers, many will be talking about this, is the, the Green New Deal. And I actually think this is an example or a framework for us to work within systemic change. Um, and even in those first, first moments, um, the, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and many of the uh, folks who endorsed the Green New Deal really pointed to the fact that any type of Green New Deal had to uh, think about the relationships between both green infrastructure, uh, but also care work. What does care work mean in this world? And, um, you know, how do we ensure that everyone is going to have affordable green housing? Um, and so that's something that really resonated with us at the Democracy Collaborative. But a core piece for us and like cornerstone of what we would see in some type of massive federal action like a Green New Deal is that it n needs to fundamentally shift the ownership and power structures that got us to the climate we have today, that got us to the inequality that we have today. Um, and that means breaking the power of these uh, industries like the financial system, um, like utilities uh, that are, you know, distributing like a are shutting people off amidst a pandemic right now and like continuing to burn fossil fuels. We need to take on the Amazons because they have huge carbon footprints uh, in addition to like holding this amount, this, uh, you know, a huge amount of power over our political system. And, um, you know, this is also an incredibly important moment amidst COVID uh, where we have um, a huge economic crisis on our hands and we need to be thinking how we are going to pull ourselves out of that and what it means because 
in the CARES Act, while it provided some amount of support, it was still going off to the fossil to fossil fuel executives, they were still getting huge bailouts. You know, all these big companies are raking in money that should have been going to small businesses, and um, that's why in this moment it becomes even more clear that it, we need to tackle climate in whatever that um, economic renewal looks like, what that building anew looks like, um, and what we have to organize around. Therefore. And just to give you um, some ideas about the types of big, the big plays that we could have that could demonstrably change the power dynamics at play. Um, one of the proposals that myself and my car colleague uh, Carla work on actively is a proposal to actually uh, nationalize the fossil fuel industry. So to actually take out the corporate power at play that um, you know is unable to wind down a system because of its incentives to continue to make money um, and then actually take it over as the US government and say that this is actually in our um, the interest of uh, the United States and as well as the world um, to actually see these these assets, these fossil fuel assets wind down. And we want to make sure that happens in the most just and equitable way possible in a way that a corporation that has a bottom line doesn't want to think about. So how do we support the workers that um, are getting laid off constantly um, in the fossil fuel sector? How do we support the communities that have been extracted for so long? How do we rebuild um, and repay uh, so much of what we have done, for instance, to indigenous land? Um, and I think that there are opportunities through con like ideas like nationalizing the fossil fuel industry for us to do that in a way um, and with shifted uh, power dynamics than we would have had otherwise. Um, and so I think that, um, but that all, all said, you know, we have to, we'll have our federal plays. And right now, it is incredibly important to also be thinking at the local and state level in terms of what we can um, do that is systemic and which is structural, that then gives us the, um, propels us forward in our federal proposals. So I'll give one example of that. Um, in New York, the Democracy Collaborative is working with um, organizers on the ground on a proposal to break the utility power in the state. Um, utility Investor-owned utilities that actually um, shut off power in a heat wave in a black neighborhood in order to keep the lights on in Williamsburg. You know, that is not the type of, that is not a just and equitable system. That is not a system we are trying to build. And so we are working on expanding and um, reforming a, pu a public owned utility called um, New York Power Authority that was actually started uh, by FDR uh, prior to his New Deal days um, as a actually a state uh, pilot in some regards of like, can we actually break you, uh, the corporate utility power by creating public alternatives? And so we are uh, taking that and also grounding it in um, more racial justice than we would have had in era of New Deal and um, trying to see this entity as a way to build community ownership uh, of our new energy system to end the fossil fuel era uh, in New York and um, start to build out more green affordable housing. So, uh, you know, we're trying to like strike it at the heart of the ownership systems that are in play that have been um, perpetuating and, ex um, you know, perpetuating the, the systems of uh, fossil fuel extraction. So, um, you know, I think that there's so much for us to do when it comes to climate and there is, uh, we are working on such a short timeline, but that does not mean that we need to um, leave behind issues of um, economic justice, of racial justice, of um, indigenous sovereignty. I think it's actually, uh, those are the ways that we can actually propel those solutions forward and that they can be uh, more powerful and uh, you know build organizing power so that we actually can achieve those goals. Because I don't think if we aren't striking at those systemic issues that we'll actually be able to get what we need when it comes to cl like um, stopping climate change. So I'll stop there and uh, hand it back over to Gar.
Thank you, Johanna. Uh, let me say that there's so much we'd like to talk about, which obviously a great amount of detail we can't get into, but everything from local small co-ops to municipal enterprise to land trust at the neighborhood level, up to things like the regional Tennessee Valley Authority to national solutions, different institutions at all different levels, the Democracy Collaborative and the Next System Project, both of which are online under those names, Democracy Collaborative, Next System Project, both of those, you can find an expansion of ideas about all of this. So in, in much greater detail than we can go into now. So let me uh, throw it open for discussion and questions and, and uh, who's got the first question, we'd be happy to try to respond to, we hope we've raised a few challenges in the, in the conversation. So there's, there's one question um, that has been posed about uh, broadband internet, which I, I think I'm somewhat qualified to, to maybe give a shot at, at answering. And so I'll, I'll do that while other questions are, are coming in. And the question is, um, it, it's whether or not municipal, using municipal bonds to finance uh, infrastructure uh, when the technology of broadband internet is changing so rapidly is a good idea. Um, given that the infrastructure could be obsolete by the time it's uh, installed. Um, so broadband internet is actually one of the areas, one of the fastest growing areas of public ownership uh, in the United States. In the past uh, several years around, uh, I think somewhere around 800 communities uh, in the US have established publicly owned broadband networks. Uh, these are usually in areas, a lot of small towns, rural areas uh, where um, internet service provided by the large corporations is uh, terrible. Uh, it's very expensive. It's very, very slow. Uh, in general, uh, the United States has some of the slowest and most expensive uh, broadband internet uh, in the developed world. Um, and so given our relatively unique uh, political landscape where local communities have relatively high degrees of uh, power, um, local councils, a lot of communities have stepped in to try and remedy this and set up their own internet networks where corporations will not provide them. These are usually fiber optic networks that provide the sort of last mile, you know, basically it's a network that provides fiber all the way up to people's homes. Um, it is orders of magnitude faster um, than the DSL or other types of service that's provided in, in some of these areas. Um, it, uh, it's not, I, I I think it's not a problem necessarily that the technology will become obsolete. Even the 5G technology and, and other technology that's emerging now builds upon a fiber network. Um, it builds upon this basic infrastructure that has to exist in, in many communities. Um, and so I don't think, A, it's, it's a big advance on what already exists and B, I think it's, uh, it's not necessarily going to be obsolete. Um, having a municipal broadband network, a community broadband network uh, in, often in these communities uh, provides much faster, much cheaper service, provides it in a much more equitable way. Um, not only is it rural communities where the service isn't provided, it's often in urban communities as well, in which like in you know, places like Cleveland and Detroit, where large swaths of the, of the community of lower income communities don't have access to the internet. And you're seeing a lot of this with COVID-19, you're seeing in lower income areas, you know, children having to sit in the parking lots of like Walgreens or, or grocery stores just to try and do their schoolwork while their wealthier, whiter peers uh, are able to like have high speed broadband networks at home. So it's a very much an equity issue as well well. Um, so yeah, I think there's an, another question coming in um, and it's on community choice energy. So I think that's probably a Johanna question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but actually much in the same vein in some regards that uh, telecom and um, energy, both like very core basic services and utilities. So uh, you know where our heart's at. Um, community choice energy. So I think uh, it was Debbie in the chat put something about how um, community Choice Energy in California has been able to really um, go, you know, pull away some of the power from investor-owned utilities like PG&E. And um, I want to resonate with that. I think that's incredibly true. And it's an example of how um, a by being able to put that back into, you know, uh, municipal or public control, um, the those community choice energy programs have been able to um, break a little bit of PG&E's power. And I think that those are things that 
we have seen replicated in other states, but we need to take this model that has been created and get um, you know federal support for things like that. I could actually imagine something like a Green New Deal um, expanding uh, both you know public ownership and community choice energy um, across the United States and provide the funding that's necessary that sometimes community choice programs run into, provide technical expertise on how to build out for instance, community solar, how to work on um, energy efficiency within community choice. So I think this is a really good example of how you can take something that is a demonstration, um, in some regards, demonstration or a um, experimentation, I'll say, at the state level, and then be able to scale it by um, articulating federal action and what could happen there. So we're actually working quite um, closely on some of these issues when it comes to the Green New Deal to inject these types of proposals um, around what I like to call energy democracy in which we are um, making our energy system much more democratic and owned by the people instead of private investors, particularly as a basic human right and also um, because of its implications for climate. There's doesn't doesn't appear to be any more questions yet in the chat. So if people want to put their questions in, um, that would be great. Um, just while that's happening, I'll I'll say one more thing about municipal broadband, and I think it applies generally to a lot of the questions or a lot of the institutions and approaches that uh, we're interested in, but that people are experimenting with. And th this is this question about preemption, uh, and one of the things that comes up in the municipal broadband discussion is that in many states, what large corporations have done when confronted with this expansion of public ownership or the expansion of community alternatives is they've jumped over uh, the local level and they've gone straight to the state legislatures where they have political power and political sort of influence. Uh, and they've put in place preemption laws, basically trying to cut off local self-determination. And you see this not only with public uh, broadband, you see it also with, uh, with energy, you see it with things like fracking. You have places in Texas, communities, sometimes Republican communities in Texas that have tried to ban fracking and the state government has come in uh, and essentially said, you, your local community, you cannot ban fracking. So that's one of the reasons why I think it's really critical that we talk and think about uh, issues of scale. Like, you know, we definitely need to build from the ground up. We definitely need to build grassroots institutions, but we have to be thinking about the different other levels and, and mechanisms of which we need to intervene because uh, we can easily get cut off at the knees, um, you know, if they go ahead above us to the state level or the federal level. So we've really got to be um, intersecting and, and uh, you know, intervening at, at all the different scales in the political economic uh, system. One of the things uh, I'd like to add for those uh, to, to know about, there has been a, an enormous amount of development of the kind that, that Thomas and Hanna and, and Isaiah have been talking about on the ground that's not covered by most of the national press. So hundreds and thousands, hundreds and, and indeed thousands of cooperatives, uh, community land trusts, efforts at worker-owned companies. These are exploding at the, at the level just beneath the surface of what you see in the day-to-day -day news or on television. Uh, you can find that on the website at the Democracy Collaborative or the Next System Project. We try to cover it, but it, many, many other publications do as well. And it's that kind of level of development that gives us really enormous hope about the future. The New Deal in the 1930s, if you look carefully at it, was built around all the experiments that were quietly going on at the local level and the state level in the 1920s. And we see that kind of developmental process going on now uh, just about to burst into national possibility. So let, we can take it from there and maybe, uh, are there other examples you wanna get into Thomas or are there other questions? Well, I, I think there, there's one question I think we'll throw over to Isaiah um, and that's this question about how the GOP is moving to the right and is there a way to bridge the divide in Congress and win support for some of these concepts? And I know that's something Isaiah has been thinking quite a lot about. So Isaiah, do you wanna maybe weigh in a little bit on that? Yes. Um, and, you know, I, my history is, is I, I, I come at this from uh, a, a, a fair amount of time of my life I've spent as a political reporter, actually, and, and editor. And I actually honestly have not seen anything in my lifetime that looks like the polarization we have today 
um, in the way that is composed. So we have something that in my view um, is almost cult-like. Uh, it goes beyond just sim the simple ideological debate that uh, frankly, if you look at some of the work that uh, we have done uh, in our next system project, um, you know, it. You know, you might think on the surface that it, it it's it's a clash of democratic socialists who are just sort of like talking de traditional democratic socialist uh, rhetoric. There is actually a fair amount of diversity in our camp in terms of what a, dem a democratic economy should look like. Um, you know, what are the strategies and and and, and uh, approaches? Uh, big debate between whether. Uh, a, a political economy should be more federalist in its scope as opposed to more centralized. All of these debates happen, right? We have something now that we're seeing in which a, a significant share of a political party has thrown down on a level of unreality that um, is, is very unique and I think it's going to be very difficult to penetrate. Here's the good news, I think. The good news is that uh, a lot of us see it for what it is, and a lot of us are looking at the political landscape um, and seeing that, first of all, we need to rebuild the institutions that foster community and foster connectedness because democracy depends on connectedness. It depends on us being able to hear and see each other and understand each other. So if you think of all of the institutions that allow us to hear, see, and understand each other, whether those are union halls or churches or you know, local newspapers, which have been eviscerated in the last uh, two decades. And so we don't have those forums uh, in the way, in the robust ways that we used to, to uh, uh, for us to share stories and to understand what's going on in our local communities and to sort of build democrat democracy based on a shared understanding, a shared knowledge. You know, we have to rebuild those institutions. Um, as we are building those institutions, then it, it becomes incumbent on organizations like ours uh, then to say that if you look around the world, our problems are not unique. We can learn from other countries. We can learn actually from other points in our own history. So for example, Thomas has written brilliant work about the fact that, you know, nationalization is not some scary thing that comes out of the, you know, the, the, that comes out of, out of the fringe. We have done this strategically in our history for very good purposes and have gotten very good public-centered, public interest results from those decisions. Bad things happen when we do it badly. And there are things that, for example, the 2008 financial crisis, which perfectly exemplified what that looks like when you nationalize something, but you don't change the underlying foundations of how it operated. And then what you're doing is just simply restoring, uh, you know, you're just taking, you're just taking something that's broken, um, but you're not changing how it functions. So it, when you repair it, it just did, does the same thing it did before. And that's not what we want. I think it will be very difficult in uh, given uh, the state of our party system right now um, that to sort of build common ground. But I think the, the action of rebuilding community institutions uh, and just our continued, those of us who see the problem have got to be continually engaged. There's no standing on the sidelines. Thanks. Let me Thanks give a, a one, you know, very often 
the one very often the difficulty people have is they don't the press doesn't cover some of the most exciting things going on around the country already that you can build on. Uh, we we here have been working with people in Cleveland, for instance, which we know a great deal about what's sometimes called the Cleveland model, which is on the ground a number of community worker owned companies connected together with a nonprofit corporation in a neighborhood of about 40,000 with purchasing power of hospitals and universities, which have a lot of public money in them, building up a new model that democratizes ownership in a very, very practical ways, the Cleveland clinics involved, the university hospital systems involved, building from the bottom up new models that are actually working. And indeed, these kinds of things are happening in many parts of the country, not covered by the press, but if you look to the Democracy Collaborative and the Next System Project, those websites, you'll find a number of the coverage of this in great detail. There are many other sites as well, but, but spreading the word about what can be done because it's being done elsewhere uh, is a good way to look at the future. That's exactly as I said, if you looked at the 1920s, this is the sort of thing that's going on without a great deal of publicity, became the foundation stones for much larger change in the next round in the New Deal period. And we think that's what's happening around the country in environment, land trust, public ownership, worker ownership, community development, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Quick note, Gar, um, and, and in fact, in Cleveland, when you talk about the media, the fact that it's not covering some of the things that are going on in the community, there is actually an effort in Cleveland to, to, do, to build a cooperative media that is rooted in community and more committed to talking about the things that are going on uh, in, in, that, in that community. And similar things are happening elsewhere. So this is part of the institution building that we have to do. We have um, quite quite a few questions coming in, so maybe we'll try and uh, try and briefly answer as many as we can before we we run out of time. Um, I'm just going to very briefly take one of them, and then I'll, I'm going to get Johanna's voice in on another question that I think she's um, she wants to speak to. Um, there was a question about uh, speaking to the benefits of establishing cooperatives and nonprofit businesses. Um, in general, uh, there's a lot of academic literature on the benefits of worker ownership, um, both in terms of cooperatives uh, and as well employee-owned businesses in terms of how they lead to greater productivity, how they lead to a lot of both direct and indirect benefits in terms of individual agency, health, um, you know, wealth building, and, and so on. I would caution, though, that any institution is only as good as you design it to be, whether it's a cooperative, whether it's a nonprofit, whether it's a publicly owned enterprise, uh, whether it's a capital, you know, for profit enterprise. Right. So it's all about values. It's all about structure. Um, it's all about getting that right to get the outcomes that you want to see. There's a lot of cooperatives, you know, big farm cooperatives that are not that innovative. There are a lot of big electricity cooperatives, not that innovative, not that you know, interesting in terms of climate change and renewable energy and so on. So it's really about getting the design right and getting the values right um, and you know, embedding democracy as much as possible. Uh, Johanna, would you like to take the question about um, reparations and racism in local communities and control? Because I know you're from Vermont, so that <laughs> the question may resonate. I know. I saw another Vermonter. I was like, yes, amazing. Um, but yes, actually, so the, the question was around concepts of local control and how that can impact our um, our vision for things like reparations. And, um, you know, uh, this person uh, mentioned that when you have the imperative to increase local control, that can uh, mean when you're working with uh, less progressive uh governments um, that it might actually stymie reparations. And I think this is a really important point and something that at the Democracy Collaborative, I think we're always having conversations about. And Isaiah even mentioned a little bit of this um, as well, federalism versus you know alternative models. And um, I think it's really important to note that like local control um, can mean, and we've seen in the past, um, a perpetuation of um, raci racist institutions. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, things like Jim Crow laws. And um, so I think as we're articulating these um, types of mandates like reparations, we have to hold, um, you know, we need things like federal action to to articulate this. And, um, but that needs to be, a, a, and we need um, accountability mechanisms built into that. We need to see uh, different processes of uh, participation, and we can also build in frameworks for 
um, community control at the same time, but there needs to be that interrelation in my mind in order for us to ensure that the wheels don't fall off the bus in a lot of ways and that it's not actually sticking to to the accountability mechanisms, for instance, that we absolutely need or um, the funding for reparations. So um, I would be very interested to hear other people at um, the Democracy Collaborative's takes on the, take on this, but I think it is uh, to me when it comes to this concept of local control about um, the balances of power that are related there too. Let me offer just a bit of perspective uh, on how one might think about the, the conversation as we come close to the end. Um, I want to, lots of things are bubbling up just under the surface in the United States that the press doesn't cover very well. Uh, we at the Democracy Collaborative, if you go to our website, the Democracy Collaborative, you can find lots of coverage of this uh, that it's not available. But what we see is a tremendous amount of experimentation and really exciting things at the neighborhood level, at the worker ownership level, the community ownership, experiments at state issues, public banking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you stand back just a little bit and think of it in terms of history and historical development, this is the kind of ferment and development, even though it's not covered by the press, that lays groundwork for transformative possibilities beyond. At the same time, there's political motion about a number of movements in climate change, the Green New Deal, et cetera. The coming together of these new institutional developments with the new politics and standing back with looking at the next decade rather than just tomorrow, tomorrow's vote, you begin to see the possibilities laying groundwork for transformative possibilities in general. Uh, this is actually rather conventional in world history and in American history that this kind of development process, starting at the grassroots, explodes into bigger things. So the kind of things we're talking about, are, we take very, very seriously. Uh, they are the groundwork for what comes next. And if you look at the Democracy Collaborative, the Next System Project, and the websites that we've, we've given at the outset, hopefully you can give more detail than we're able to give at this time. Let me leave it at that. Are there other comments that uh, you, Thomas, Isaiah, Ohana, want to make before we close down? All right, I think we, we have a little bit more time, so I think we're going to take some some more questions. I think we've got about fifteen minutes or so left. Um, there is one question that I, I think I'll you know that you can take is there's a, a couple questions about what is the role of the academy and academia um, in advancing a democratic economy. And I know that you're you know you've been in academia, Gar, and you've thought about this role of the academy and and training and and so on. So do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, thanks, Thomas. I didn't realize we had that time left. I thought we were cut off. I'm glad glad to see we've got more time. Um, yes, indeed, we're beginning to see studies at the, at the, a new reader that we've just published by a, a co co director of the Next uh, System Project, Gus Speth. It's called New Systems Reader. It's New Systems, and what it is is a collection of essays that have been contributed over time to our Next System Project, and it's really a, a wonderful resource for people to think practically about if you don't like the way corporate capitalism produces income inequality, ecological uh, disasters in many areas, dislocation of communities, racial difficulties that are not resolved, and if you don't like the way state socialism does concentration of power, and if you don't see the old traditional kind of liberal solutions actually changing trend the way we'd hope they would do, how do we think about the future? And as a historian and a political economist, the kind of things you see experimenting on the ground now often are prefigure, suggest the future. And that big debate at the intellectual level, as well as the practical level, if you think about the committees of correspondence that led to the constitutional change, the prehistory of the constitution, the prehistory of the new deal, the discussion not only of practical things like cooperatives, land trusts, et cetera, but how would you put them together into a new design that is neither concentrated corporate capitalism or not concentrated state socialism, but a vision that builds up from these practical experiments, that debate on the level of what makes sense? What is the sketch of the future? What is the theory? That's also going on and beginning to develop in a very serious way at the university level amongst people online in the debates in the Next System Project, which we run as, as well out of the Democracy Collaborative, lots of discussion, lots of papers back and forth. 
trying to open up a big picture debate at the same time we concentrate on concrete things like land trusts and worker-owned companies and community banks, things that are going on environmentally interesting projects all over the country that are kind of elements that when you put them together, you begin to see a new mosaic that looks something different from any of the systems, but very democratic, very decentralized. So I wanna open up that bigger perspective about whether you could consider now as a time, not simply where there's a wonderful experiments going on around the country, and there are many, many more than the ones we've talked about today, but also that they begin to suggest a mosaic, a different possibility, a different ultimate systemic design, and then to stand back and say, you know, this kind of thing happens all the time in history, laying groundwork of experiments for something that becomes transformative beyond the moment. And that's what we're talking about, how that intersects with the politics that builds on the new experiments, that begins to build movements that take them seriously, that are already taking them seriously, particularly in environment and energy issues, but in many other areas in terms of worker co-ops and land trusts, we see this developing just beneath the level of what the press normally does not cover uh, at the Democracy Collaborative and the Next System Project, we cover this in intensely. And so there's a lot going on on the ground that we think has, has ramifications well beyond uh, the experimental level towards next stage development beyond. So that, that larger perspective of how over time these seedlings become sprouts and trees and big, they grow into things beyond is historically conventional. It's regular. And we're seeing things now that we think are lay groundwork for something far beyond, in many cases, quite sophisticated things like some of the banking and worker owned things, Cleveland experiments, the land trusts, the kinds of things we're seeing pop up all over the country that give hope for a different model of the future, more democratic, more ecologically sustainable, <clears throat> and more community building. Thanks. We've got a little bit of time Thanks, more. And perhaps a few folks can all kick, kick in. Thomas? Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Gar. Um, there's a couple questions um, in that have been posted about uh, the Biden administration and what we can maybe expect from the Biden administration with regards to supporting some of these initiatives. Um, Isaiah, do you want to maybe talk to some of the those questions um, about you know what we can expect, Biden, um, things of that nature? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, this idea of local economy preservation funds, which is a direct response to the um, damage to local communities that has been, that has been done by COVID-19. Uh, we have put forward that idea uh, to the Biden transition team. And so they have that in their bucket of, of solutions from uh, many, many different organizations. Um, we think that uh, that's important and we're, optimistic about that uh, because I think while the Biden team as a whole is presenting itself in a way as a third Obama administration, um, I think the reality is that there are at least some people in that orbit who understand that you simply cannot replicate 2008 through 2016. The problems of 2020 and 2021 are very different and don't lend themselves to that level of politics. Um, we've heard how not only that the system is fundamentally broken, but you got to deal with the reality that people understand it at a much more visceral level than they have in the past. So the prospects, I think, are that you know it will there will be a, an impulse to kind of let's do traditional um, centrist liberalism, but we have to keep up a level of agitation that I think, frankly, is represented by the work that people like Johanna do, is doing. Um, you know what she's doing and our climate program exemplifies a new generation of visionary activism. It's not about slogans, but it's about concrete solutions. 
And even when we put forward slogans, let's talk about the one that keeps getting uh, that Biden, that uh, Joe Biden very aggressively um, slapped down during his campaign, which was defund the police. Defund the police is not a simply a catchy visceral slogan. It is an invitation to rethink how we do public safety in America. And that rethinking takes us to new uh, uh, ways of thinking about how we deal with the roots of crime, how we approach mental illness, how we, all of the things that we, we, that we should be doing to protect people that we don't spend money on because we only think in the one dimensional spectrum of officers with guns. So I think the best thing that we can do during the next four years is to put resources and give encouragement to these new thinkers and we look not just at the slogans, but we look at the policy. And then we connect that up with a new generation of young people who are now in Congress. You know, AOC is just the, the, the icing on the cake, but there are a bunch of really smart young people now in Congress. And we need to give them the moral support to push their policies and solutions forward. It will take an incredible outside game as much as it will take a very smart inside game. Let, let me add that. also a, a, an interesting and in, intermediate game that's going on as well, uh, which may, some folks haven't noticed. Probably the most advanced and interesting and complex development of the kind we're talking about has happened in Cleveland where there's a series of community worker-owned companies, land trusts supported in part by hospitals and universities. It's a Cleveland project that's well known amongst people as maybe the leading project in the country, uh, exemplifying some of the things we're talking about, environmentally very sophisticated and community owned and worker-owned jointly and large, 400 workers now involved in one way or another. So it's a really powerful experiment. And that looks like a freestanding experiment that most folks around the country haven't heard much about. So it's kind of isolated if you've not heard about it. Well, something interesting has happened in the last week of, about that. The, pre the president, Biden-elect, uh, has announced who is going to be the secretary of housing and urban development, HUD. And it is, in fact, the congresswoman from Cleveland who intimately knows the knowledge about the new experiments and is likely to be able to take that in and as no one else could, we hope, to a new level of sophistication because she's, the experiment is so practical and someone like that knows about it. We're hopeful that something like that could occur. But those kinds of transformative possibilities exist from experiment to larger national possibility if we make the effort and if we try to exploit opportunities when we see them. Thank you. Thank you, Gar. I think we have maybe five or so minutes left, and uh, I think maybe we can just each take a go round and try and answer as many questions in a short period of time left from the, the chat as we can, um, if that works. And I'll just, uh, I'll go first, and then Johanna uh, will go next. And so I just wanted to touch on the role of the Academy very quickly um, and just say that, you know, what we've seen over the past 30 years is a very concerted attempt by the conservatives, very successful to take over the academy, um, you know, to take over various departments, various schools, uh, also to take over the courts and the judiciary. So there definitely needs to be a focus and, you know, on, on that from, from the left, from the other side uh, and doing something, I don't want to say similar, we don't want to replicate exactly what they've done, but somehow counter that because, you know, they've totally eaten our lunch, I think, on, on terms of uh, taking over institutions. Um, there's a question about uh, the tax system and moving away from um, from labor income and moving towards uh, towards taxation on unearned income. Um, I would like slightly reshift the question a little bit and just say that you know one of the really big things uh, you know that is going to be uh, ahead of us right now is 
state and local governments because of the COVID crisis are going to be facing a period of terrible austerity. I mean, we're already seeing it with transit systems. We're already seeing it with budget cuts in almost every city and county uh, in, in the country. Um, and this is because unlike the federal government, which uh, you know has monetary sovereign monetary authority, uh, state and local governments do not, and they do have to you know balance their, their books. So state and local governments really need to think, I think, differently about how to generate revenue in terms of uh, in terms of supporting social services and economic development and so on. And there's really interesting examples from public ownership of land, public ownership, you know, like several Western states have these giant sovereign wealth funds uh, based on resource extraction in most cases, but you could do these wealth funds in, in different ways as well. Um, you can cross subsidize services through ownership um, in many ways and, and things like land value tax, you know, community land trusts also work, you know, similar, similar to that. Um, and then lastly, I'll just really quickly finish um, with this question about water. Um, you know, what you are seeing, I think, in the United States, but also around the world is this movement towards what we call remunicipalization. Um, and this is a, a growing hunger of people who are not only opposed to privatization, but are starting to think about how to take assets and services back into the public uh, in various forms. And water, especially, is a very, very prominent one around the world. Uh, and you're starting to see it in the United States as well with resistance to water privatization. So I think there's a growing movement, and Johanna can speak to this with electricity, but there's a growing movement around the world of people at the local level who are thinking beyond simply resisting corporate control and privatization and thinking in favor of, of a pro-public future. Uh, Johanna, you want to take a few last questions? Yeah, I can just kind of like end on comments. Um, I'll say, I'll just reiterate that Thomas is totally right. There is a like growing movement uh, in the United States to um, not just fight uh, corporate uh, co-optation over our uh, public services, but to actually fight to build something anew and something that um, is is different from maybe how we've seen public institutions developed in the future, um, in the past, and like building something that's uh, right for this moment. It's like more grounded in racial equity, more grounded in um, you know it, the need for access and 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 all of these things. So yeah, thanks for bringing up the water example. Also, um, I guess uh, as I close out, uh, touch on what Isaiah mentioned about. Um, you know, when it comes to this moment in Congress, and I actually think like, yes, we do not have like control of the Senate, but uh, what we do have is a new generation of folks who are getting into those seats. And like, we are seeing um, really inc incredible and aggressive moves on the progressive side to um, oust, uh, you know, folks that are just like not going to do the transformational change that have shown that they're not um, up for up for making it happen. And so, you know, seeing Cori Bush come in and Jamal Bowman, um, these are folks that are starting the vanguard and are, are unafraid to um, do what Isaiah said and like articulate what defund the police means in policy terms and um, re reflect what uh, movements want as well. So um, I'll head it, I'll jump it off to Isaiah at that um, as, since I know we're running close on time. Uh, I'll just take 15 seconds just to say that the work of system change is multidimensional. It needs all of us. It, it needs those of us who are versed in culture, those of us who are versed in politics, those of, who are versed in economics. It, it, it takes all of that because, you know, it, the, the system that is pulling us down is complex. The system that we need to build needs to be all encompassing so that it works for all of us on the multiple levels at which it must work. Let me just uh, bring it down to earth. There's a lot in now for, there's a lot that can be done right where each of us lives. And so there are many, many projects from land trusts to worker owned companies to cooperatives, all very practical. Or the website of the Next System Project, the website of the Democracy Collaborative and many other places give you much, many, many examples of things that are going on all around the country uh, that are very down to, down to earth and are stepping stones towards the next system. So we want to encourage everyone not to take this in the abstract way, think about where we are going big time, but also what can be done tomorrow right there, hometown where we all live. So thanks very much for joining us today. And we will look forward to seeing the next round of projects next year. Thanks very much. Thank you all.
Thank you.